actually had three years in a row. Um, you have to balance the need to get through your slides as quickly as possible so everyone can eat, with also balancing the fact that I have a predisposition to talk quite quickly. Um, so if at any point I'm speaking so fast you can't understand, you just put a hand in the air, I won't ask you a question, but I will try to slow down. So I'm going to talk about use case management. I'm going to mention a little bit about scaling it out as well. I'm going to talk about framework standardization, risk and automated deployment, as explained. Um, this is who I am. So my background is in security operations and security engineering. I've worked for ECS security since I graduated from Napier University. I studied computer security and digital forensics. Um, now my role is professional services lead for Sim Engineering. We work a lot with Splunk, which is a big data platform, which I'm going to mention a little bit towards the end. But my actual previous roles, I started as a SOC analyst, so security operations center, so processing the stuff that comes out of all the technology that we love. Um, I then moved into instant response as a responder, a security engineer, and now as a manager consultant, I take care of a load of engineers that actually do that work. For those of you that aren't familiar with Cyber Scotland Connect, I highly recommend you check it out. It's a community organization based in Scotland that just tries to be a funnel for all the other communities and great work we do out there. And also, if you are interested in Splunk, I run the Splunk user group at Edinburgh. Uh, my employer, very quickly, ECS Security. So we're a managed SOC provider. We provide SOCs up and down the UK. We have a multi-tenanted SOC headquartered here in Edinburgh. And we do fundamentally a lot of advanced threat hunting, threat detection, and response type stuff. And we're Splunk's chosen SME for security in the UK as well. So in the next, I say 25 minutes, I'm going to try and get it closer to maybe 17, 18 minutes. I'm going to talk very quickly about detective controls, just so we're framing this entire conversation. What are use cases, so we can hopefully align on a rough definition. I'm going to talk about a common taxonomy for use cases. So this is the Magma framework, which is a fantastic piece of work that I'm going to go through. Version control, so use cases as code, how to document them in a, an appropriate way. And then finally, talk a little bit, how, a bit about how we've been using, um, essentially, um, Ansible and Puppet and automation software to deploy these things in an automated way to scale out when you're dealing with hundreds of use cases. Click is probably a good call. Okay, so these are three of the primary types of security controls that you can have. Okay, so preventative, as you might imagine, is trying to stop threats ever occurring within your environment, impacting your business. We have detective controls, which is what we're going to be focusing on. So these are things that discover attacks, whether they be active or passive, attacking your organization. And then corrective comes after that, and they try to decrease the impact of attacks that are, in fact, happening at, within your business. Um, so examples of preventative, we've got IPSs, firewalls, antivirus. Obviously, when these things fail, we then want to know, enter detection. So detective examples would be things like honeypots, when we're trying to tempt attackers to attack us in ways that we can then detect and respond from. We've got log monitoring, which is where the use cases that I'm going to talk about come in. And we've got things like threat hunting. And this is where we do not have existing detective measures in place that are automatic, but we actually go into the data to try and find out what may or may not already be out there attacking us. And then corrective, instant response, orchestration, taking actions to try and limit that impact that an attacker is having. So, frameworks are really important because they help us standardize. Um, you've already heard from many speakers this morning that have mentioned frameworks in one way or another. And these things, they, they just help us solidify and get ahead of the game. But rather than having to work out, well, what are all the different types of instant response processes we should have? Oh, well, look, NIST released a really nice one, and SAM's made it really readable. Awesome. So really important to use frameworks. Um, before we start talking about Magma, we're going to talk about what a use case is. So this is the dictionary definition of a framework, sorry, of a use case. It's relatively useful in the sense that it you know, helps stop some arguments that I have at work on a regular basis, a specific situation in which a product or service could potentially be used, but it's not very specific. It doesn't, it doesn't really give us much use within the security context of when I say I have a security monitoring use case trying to detect credential stuffing, how I might outline that and define it. What attributes might it need? So this is where Magma comes into it, and you'll excuse my, me including a Pokemon. It's not a Pokemon. It is, in fact, a framework. So this is uh, Management Growth Metrics and Assessments. It was released by FI Isaac in the Netherlands, uh, I think 2017. 
Uh, I think we're using a slightly different version of PowerPoint here, so sorry for the slides getting a bit messed up, but that doesn't matter. So this is a framework that tries to, one, give you a taxonomy for de defining use cases, the drivers, and the things you need to fuel them, but it also gives you a way of looking at the maturity of those use cases and trying to plot them in a way that's standardized. Now, when you're dealing with one or two use cases, this isn't really appropriate. It's complete overkill, and it will take you longer to read the PDF than it will to actually implement those few use cases. But when you're a company like mine and throughout our customers have developed and implemented thousands of different use cases, managing that at scale becomes an operational nightmare. If you want to update one, which one? In which environment? Which attribute did you change and when? Did you introduce a risk into an organization because you fat thing at a zero? Which is in fact something that happened a while ago, but I'll not talk about that because there was no impact and everyone was fine. But the other thing it does is it gives us a taxonomy for the attributes that a use case, is, use case should have, and it maps them to other frameworks, which I'm about to go into. So these are the various layers. I'm not going to cover all of them, don't worry. Right at the top, though, we do have drivers, so business or compliance. Right at the bottom, we have detective technologies that are the use cases are deployed upon. And then at the very bottom, we have events, i.e. the log sources that fuel the use cases. We're going to squarely focus in the middle. Um, level one use cases, this is essentially mapped to the kill chain and a few other threats that I'll share in a second. But this helps you at a really high level just say, well, what am I looking for here? Oh, well, I'm going to be looking for reconnaissance, or I'm going to be looking for actions on objectives, or I'm going to be looking for DDoS, or something like that. Real high level, but straight away helps you to start categorizing your use cases. Moving down to level two, we start to look at the tactical use cases. So this is, will include threat actors. This will include things along the lines of, well, within DDoS, what type of DDoS? Is it application-based, network-based? Is it volume-based? Or is it going to do something else? It helps you, again, move down to that next layer of granularity and the attributes that come with it. Now, you also notice there's one-to-many relationship. A level one use case can have multiple level twos. A level two can have multiple level threes. And as we move out of what's called the threat layer, so that's just defining the threats themselves, we move into the implementation layer. And within the use case definition, this will contain two primary components. The first is the actual detection logic itself. So in the case of Splunk, that's SPL. Other scenes will have different ways of describing what a use case is, but it's the language that's used to actually detect the threat. The other thing it will have is the actual technique that it's trying to detect. So this is mapped to MITRE's attack framework, which I'll talk about you know, shortly. But this essentially, right the way down at a very granular level, says, OK, so we're looking for DDoS. We're looking for an application-level DDoS. And we detect that because we know they use this technique when they try to do it. So straight away, working at either end, you're able to expand upon and categorize exactly what you're looking for and why. <clears throat> So level one, as I said, maps the kill chain. So the kill chain was originally developed by Lockheed Martin. It's a really useful way of categorizing um, threat actors and the attacks that they per perpetuate. We've got pre-attack phases, we've got attack phases, and we've got post-attack phases. I'm not going to go through each and every one, but the important thing is here, it's just a way to categorize your use case. What is your use case looking at? Is it a pre-attack use case or a post-attack use case? Is it looking for actions on the objective, i.e. stealing your data, taking down your environment, et cetera? Or is it actually trying to detect when a, an attack is scraping your website for the details of your IT staff? That is the first point that we start to categorize the use case. Other areas are things that don't fit into the kill chain, which is why they're important to consider, because not everything does. Things like DDoS, extortion, trying to get your company blacklisted by fraudulent activity, sabotaging, etc. So as we move down to level two, you're not meant to be able to read that, but actually you can on this great screen, so that's good. But these are some of the categories, and I think there's uh, actually 61. I think I accidentally missed one because it made my table look um, neater. But um, these are the next level down. These are the actual things that are occurring when we take that top level category going down. So we've got obviously things like, oh, did I do an animation? Yes, I did. So we've got things like detection evasion techniques. So you were now saying, well, we want a use case to actually detect when malware, for example, is trying to evade being caught by our advanced malware protection software. Or again, we were looking at application level DDoS protocol level volume based. And remember, you can have a one to many. So we start at the top actions on objectives or let's say DDoS. And then we've got three other DDoS type of attacks that's linked to that high level use case. So we move on to level three. 
implementation layer. So this is where we're talking about the attack techniques, and we're also talking about detection logic. So the attack framework, so this is from MITRE, it's a fantastic piece of work. This actually profiles and lists 244 different techniques and a number of um, techniques and tactics, sorry. Um, and these will say things like, you know, have a plain text description of exactly what it is. It will have technologies that could be used to detect it. And it will have the kind of logs that you might want to bring in for those detection based uh, rules or use cases to actually let you know when it's happening. Um, so again, it's not a great image for the screen, but there's a lot of them, as you can see. And they're all broken down into their various areas. And the whole idea here is if you are able to say, well, I've got a use case that looks for a shared web route, or I've got a use case that detects for, uh, I don't know, um, compile after delivery. So if my Outlook process is suddenly compiling software, that's not normal, so I might have a use case to detect it. That's the most granular we're going to go with in the methodology, but you can define a lot within it. So for the sake of argument, let's say that you've all gone away like the incredible security practitioners you are, and you've gone and implemented a framework. Let's, for example, say it's Magma, and at the end of it, you've got this fantastic use case factory. So you define them, you have sim engineers or big data professionals, you know, building these use cases and deploying them within your environment. This is where you, however, start to run into a problem, because how do you actually manage that at scale? It's great that you've got a process, it's great that you've now been filling in a Word document for every use case, but how do you actually index them? How do you find them? How do you record change? How do you do things like tune, where you want to modify the rules to be more, to detect more true positives instead of false positives? And these are the problems that we face in our business before we you know, really took apart the problem and looked into these types of things. So what we did was we turned to things that developers have been using for a very long time, as has Microsoft Word. So, Everyone that's used track changes in an office suite or similar, even in SharePoint, for example, should be able to grasp the basic concepts of version control. But first of all, we've got to have something to put in. Now, putting in an XML-based Word document, for example, or let's say an Excel sheet into a version control system isn't ideal because there's tons of superfluous metadata, you know, how should the text look, all that kind of stuff that would get drawn along with it. Neither is a text file that's just one long sentence with a ton of attributes that you define. And this is where the standardization comes in. So this particular example is taken from Sigma, which is a generic signature format for SIEM systems. And it's really, really interesting because they've picked the exact same things that we picked when we built ours, but it, they're using YAML files. So it's a really simple way of defining attributes and fields within a file that then something like Python would read and then do something with. So as you can see within this one, we have a number of attributes that we might want within a use case. We've got the plain text description, we've got the author, we've got the type of logs that we're interested in, the event IDs, because this is a Windows-based use case. And straight down, this is level, layer three, remember, so level three as a, as a use case, we now have this use case defined as code. This is the kind of thing that a version control system loves because every time you change a character, every time I add in a new event ID, it's gonna record exactly what happened and who by. You then get this incredible granular history that you can go back that's auditable, that enables you to roll back if needed, and more importantly, enables you to then automate the deployment of. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about Git. So Git is a version control system. It's probably one of the largest used in the world. Um, you might know that Microsoft recently bought GitHub, which is fundamentally based around Git, and they contribute heavily to it in the open source community as well. But Git really covers this concept really, really simply. You have a master branch. This is what would be described as your production branch or your live branch. It's the thing that is often deployed into production. And for the sake of what we're talking about, this is where your use cases are. All the use cases that you have deployed into production are within your master branch. So straight away, what's in production? I don't need to look in production. I don't need to open a graphical user interface and click into hundreds of thousands of use cases. I just open this and I can see all of them listed out really neatly. Okay, brilliant. And now I want to make a change. So I open a ticket, I have change control, I have all the checks and balances the process tries to enforce, but I can't make a change to master. 
I try, I try and open a use case, try and make a change, try and save it, and I'm blocked. And that's because the, the tooling will force me to create a feature branch or a change branch, for example. So that branch is the same as master, but it now enables me to make modifications. All of this is tracked in what's called the commit history and enables me to see any changes I've made and indeed any changes anyone else has made. So I go along, I rapidly prototype some new use cases, maybe that have come out the back of threat modeling or the latest white paper or conference talk I've seen, and I get to the point where I'm happy. I test my changes and I'm ready to put back into master, meaning I'm ready to put it into production. Now at this point, the tooling enables me to do things like check that my code is okay, because what I can do is simply say to a co-developer or SOC analyst or similar, can you just check before I commit this in? I can enforce in the tool set that I have to have that kind of check, that someone has to approve it with that entire history being recorded. So that's really useful. It's especially useful in businesses like ours where we have um, hun over hundreds of analysts potentially making changes to use cases and with the want to make sure that those changes are both accurate and can be rolled back if there's a problem. So what does this look like at scale? So at scale, you have multiple developers working within the same repository. So let's say your master use case repository. And they're able to work simultaneously because the system itself, when you want to merge back in, will simply ask you to resolve any conflicts. But depending on your workflow, hopefully you're gonna be working on different use cases anyway. But if you're not, it's okay because the system allows you to make those combined merges and press on. So now let's say that you deployed the framework, you have some incredible use cases, you've deployed version control, what's next? So next is then pulling it all together. And pulling it all together enables us to then visualize it, which is the final thing I'm gonna show you. So as a process, we have our use case, we have first and foremost defined our level one and level two, so we understand the business drivers, we understand the top level threats that we're trying to protect against, and then we have prototyped our level three use case. This is our detection logic that outlines the exact techniques we're trying to detect when they're executed by an attacker. We've committed our code into our dev branch, meaning that we're playing with it, we're testing it, we want some feedback, so we get it validated by a peer, and they approve it to go into master. Now we've got our code in master, what we know is that it's ready to go into production because it couldn't be in master if it wasn't. So we now have our pipeline built. Now within what we've done, we've essentially created a number of scripts that rather than create config files that we have to manually deploy, we simply have a script that goes to master and says, hey, you've got some new use cases for me. It's able to look at the commit history since the last time it deployed and it deploys the new ones into production. Obviously, there's change windows and all the other checks and balances involved, but the technology doesn't require us to do anything other than ensure those approvals are there. So we now have our use, new use case package, and it's been validated and pushed into production. We now have new use cases in production. We have a clear auditable history of exactly where they came from. We have a well-defined level one through to level three use case history, so we know exactly why this use case got deployed. We know what attackers it's trying to fend off, and we know what techniques we're looking for within the technology logs. So when you actually pull this all together, and Splunk is a technology for big data, it's the one we use, but there's many others, because it's now all as code, we can do what you can do with all big data samples. We can visualize it. So rather than you know, use cases being static binary pieces of config, or packages that we would have to take apart with a disassembler or a database we'd have to try and pull. Because it's within a big data tool, we can start to visualize it and using some relatively straightforward dashboarding techniques. So what Splunk did in this app, which they released for free, which you're happy to play around with, is they enable you to actually take apart all those attributes of your use case and then showcase it in an app. Now you might think that's only useful as a sales tool, and it is, but it's also useful for a SOC analyst looking to deploy a new use case in a different environment. So our SOC analysts work on many different customers and those customers have different requirements for security monitoring. But if I'm looking at one environment and going, you know what, I, you know, I've got some time, I'd like to deploy some new use cases, rather than just having to come up with a new idea or you know, go through a ton of source code, I can open the app and go, ah, oh, well actually, yeah, we don't have any basic brute force detection on this account. That was silly. What 
what's this use case about? Rather than having to go into the use cases that we've defined as code, even though they're nicely defined within a YAML file, we've got this lovely user interface that we can play with. It's also a user interface that you can then put in front of your customer, or indeed, whether that's internal to your business or externally, and say, well, why don't you have a browse? A new business unit's coming online with a great digital initiative. Why don't you look through all the use cases we've got that might be applicable to your cloud strategy? Oh, okay, I will, fantastic. And of course, because it's a big data tool, we can filter, we can play, and we can make other interesting visualizations like this one. So this is that essential same picture from before of all the MITRE attack techniques, but it's using a heat map to actually show in real time exactly what use cases are deployed within the environment. So by opening this dashboard, if I'm looking for control gaps, I can glance and go, quite a few. I'm unable to detect an attacker if they are in this particular, using this technique within my environment. And then I'm able to obviously consult the actual MITRE attack definition and say, well, how could I do that? And maybe that's now a ticket or a request for people that develop my rule sets to make sure that they've closed that gap as soon as possible. The other thing I can do is I can do a differential between data sources I'm ingesting and use cases that I have within my library but haven't yet deployed for those data sets. And so by tweaking simply a drop down, because it's again, big data tool, it's just a simple dashboard at the end of the day, I can say, well, what data sources do I have what, that could fuel use cases that haven't been deployed yet? Another map, another heat map that enables me to go, well, we've got another six that aren't even deployed. Could we just get them deployed, please? Oh, of course, no problem. And it's that kind of analytics that by doing all the previous steps, you're then able to do. And that fundamentally comes down to risk management. It comes down to looking at your organization, identifying the gaps, and prioritizing the mitigations that you want to put in place to try and mitigate the risk. So, uh, as I said, the app is uh, free to download, free to experiment with. It's got a ton of use cases out of the box with it. Splunk itself is also free to download and play with up to like 500 meg a day. Do have a play. Um, that is pretty much me. There's a ton of resources. Uh, none of these hyperlinks will work if you're sitting in the audience, but these slides will be shared and they will do work. Google them all, they'll come up. Um, and finally, uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you're not a member of Sabs Scott Connect, free, it's free to join. It's not a membership organization. It is just for the community. Please do check us out. And uh, yeah, any questions, please reach out to me on Twitter or by my email. Thank you. Thanks very much, Harry. Uh, just waiting for the microphone to connect. Um, these things do take the time, unfortunately. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, we'll use this one instead. So, um, just before lunch, uh, we might have time for one or two questions if people are curious to ask one of our three presenters. Uh, any questions? Uh, we do have the nice throwable microphone, uh, which I'm more than happy to throw. Or unless Harry wants to oblige. Uh, anybody got any questions for either Harry or two of our other previous presenters? No? I can see. Oh, yes, yep. yes, one over there. Wait, oh. Sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> bit, bit too keen. There you go, Harry, you can have this mic. I'm actually just want to ask a question about hype brands, because you were talking at the earlier, at the beginning of your chat about hype and how that has opened up the security risks within um, the internet and the way in which people are now, you know, retailing, you know, accessing retail. Uh, is that something that you see is going to increase? Because I have teenage children and this is the thing they're really into, is into, you know, these download dumps and all these sorts of things that they do on a regular basis from um, large um, retail, you know, hyped brand organisations. Is this something that you're seeing as being a threat in the retail sort of sector? Um, I, I think hype to a, certain to a certain extent is it generates a certain amount of attack traffic. I don't think it's uh, a specific trend. There are many, many uh, other drivers for the credential stuffing um, and the associated attacks with that. Um, it just so happens that those sort of hype events have created some very notable um, attacks. But yeah, generally we're seeing any event where there is more demand than there is product available. 
there's always going to be uh, an opportunity for these types of bots to go in there and do inventory theft. Do we have any other questions? Yep, if you want to throw the, uh, see if we can get it across. Here we go. Excellent. Wow. Funky technology. This is a question for Ivan. I remember him as a student. Um, you talk about psychologists, but what about the role of ethnographers and sociologists in understanding what's going on in an organization? Yeah, that, that is a really, really good question. Uh, I think you're right. It's not only about psychology, but all the human sciences. It's, a, it's, a, it's again, it's all about us, about humans, how we take decisions. So there are many, sociology has a lot of research. The other, the other day I was in Google Scholars, and there is a lot of research, a lot of paper, very, very interesting papers that I encourage all of you to, to go and find around deception on the internet, identity uh, management, when, when uh, hacktivism, uh, cyberbullying. So there are other, there are other uh, fields that should contribute the, the same as psychology. But as you know, there is an overlap with psychology and, and other social sciences, like uh, behavioral economics and how we take decisions under following a, an authority and all this stuff. So I don't know if, if I re <laughs> respond to your question uh, or you need some more clarification, but I, I, think, I think you are right. Other, other social sciences, they should contribute to that. No, no it's great. I mean, it's, a, it's a good discussion to have, and I, I think it's always just useful to remember that yeah. this um, security is more than technology. But I think everyone kind of sees that now. Okay, thank you. So thanks, Ivan. Okay, um, it's now coming up to uh, 10 past, we've just gone 10 past. Do we have one last question or do we want to break for lunch? Break for lunch? Okay, fantastic, thank you very much. So please give a round of applause for our three presenters. Um, if you make your way, there's plenty of food, so no panic there. Um, we start back.